All right, let's begin. So uh, welcome to our introduction to machine learning workshop, everyone. As we get started today, we would like to begin with a territorial acknowledgement. The University of Waterloo acknowledges that much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land granted to the six nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. Our active work towards reconciliation takes place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is coordinated within the Office of Indigenous Relations. So once again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's workshop. My name is Ethan and I work for Wattspeed here at the University of Waterloo. My colleague Derek is on the call with us today as well. So if you need any technical assistance with your video or audio settings, please message myself or Derek privately in the chat and we would be happy to assist you. As we progress through today's session, there will be a Q&A segment at the end. So if you do have any questions come up, please feel free to put them in the chat and we will address them once we reach this portion of the workshop. Alternatively, if you would like to take your microphone off mute to ask your question, that would also be welcome. So without further ado, I will turn it over to our co-leads for today's workshop, Larry and Delina. Larry, please take it away. All right, welcome everybody. Um, so my name is Larry Simon. I'm a uh, data science practitioner myself um, and uh, uh, previously uh, an executive at one of the big four management consulting firms. Uh, it's an exciting time, what can I say? Um, we've seen data-driven decision-making, like a real shift in how corporations, businesses, and organizations are making decisions on a daily basis, all driven by data. It's across all of the different industries, uh, it's really been driven by the development of the internet, of much faster computing capability that we've had in the past, and recent breakthroughs in machine learning and, and deep learning in particular. We've seen an explosion of new applications. Um, it's an exciting time to, to be involved in all of this. Um, so we're going to look specifically today at machine learning, and uh, to do that, I'm going to hand it over to Delina, who will uh, introduce some of the ideas and then uh, give you a bit of a demo of, uh, of uh, one of the techniques. Cool. Uh, so hi, everybody. Just to quickly introduce myself, my name is Delina, and I've been teaching in this program for the last roughly four years. Um, I currently work as a director of analytics at a company called Misplay, which is a mobile gaming uh, loyalty program, loyalty platform. So we apply all sorts of concepts across data science, analytics, machine learning in our day-to-day -day work and throughout hopefully today. And, and of course, during the program, um, I typically try to share uh, quite a bit of examples of how the things you're learning in the certificate are actually applicable in the real world. But for today, we're gonna to start with a quick description of what is machine learning. So for those of you who are new to the field and you've been hearing the term machine learning for a while, we'll do a quick introduction of what that is. And then we'll do a short demo of how to build a machine learning model in Python. So hopefully that will give you a sense of what you can expect in the program and the types of technical skills um, and theoretical knowledge that you learn uh, as you complete the program with us. So to get started with what machine learning is, uh, this is a, a subset of artificial intelligence, and um, really artificial intelligence is a very broad term that captures the ability for machines to execute tasks that are given to them. And so, um, believe it or not, even your automated Excel file that can automate some calculations for you is some form of very basic artificial intelligence. But machine learning is really the subset of artificial intelligence, which tries to automate decision making by identifying some cause and effect patterns in data. And data scientists or people who work in this field, our job really is to find the data that's going to help us or help the machine learn how to make decisions and then train or teach the machine um, how to make decisions using the data that's available that's available in, in the world around us. So if you can imagine um, from your own experience, you probably interact with machine learning and AI on a regular basis. As a quick example, uh, everybody probably has some sort of streaming software. And if you think about or streaming program like Netflix or Disney Plus or Amazon Prime, um, and that's a really common example of machine learning and, and really data science in our day-to-day -day life. So um, if you think about this idea of 
data inputs, which in your case, as a consumer, your data would be things like what TV shows have you watched in the past? How have you rated them? Um, which type of TV categories or movie or show categories do you spend the most time and resources in? Um, and by doing by taking those actions, the machine learning model behind Netflix or behind any streaming service is learning more about you and making recommendations that are more relevant to you so that anything that you see in the future um, is more uh, personalized to your own experience. So that's really the idea behind machine learning. Now, if we didn't have machine learning models and we had to learn about every single customer manually, or we had to um, learn about every single customer's preference of what TV or movie shows to watch, this would of course take a very, very, very long time. And so that's why we say that machine learning is really a way to scale personalization, to scale decision-making so that companies can deliver these highly personalized experiences um, across the board. And of course, remove um, you know human bias and decision making as much as possible. Now there are different types of machine learning uh, models out there. And so in this course we will try we will learn about some of them. Of course, this field is very big. Um, we also have the even more in-depth area of, of deep learning, which we do touch on in, in this certificate. But the three main areas of machine learning that we'll start to learn about in the certificate are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement. Um, we'll do a quick introduction to deep learning, but reinforcement learning is another area that we cover uh, through the different certificates in our data science programs at Wattspeed um, with our partnership with the University of Toronto. Now, supervised learning, um, these are machine learning models which learn relationships between input data points, like which we call features. So in machine learning lingo, typically data inputs are called features and an output variable. So this is typically called a target variable. Um, a really quick example, uh, let's say that you were, uh, you have a child and you're trying to teach them how to identify different uh, types of animals. So what you might do is you might show a picture of a cat to your child, a picture of a dog, a picture of a squirrel, and you might describe these animals in different ways. So you might say something like cats are small, they have small faces, long tails, um, and they might be any one of these colors. And maybe dogs are a little bit bigger, they make a certain kind of sound, um, they have pointier faces, and maybe squirrels are really small, they have round ears, and so on. So if you're teaching somebody else how to recognize an animal, you're providing data inputs. And so in that example, you're providing inputs like the color of the animal, the shape of their ears, their size, perhaps their weight, or any other features or data inputs that might be relevant. And in the future, when the child sees an animal that fits the description which you've provided, they'll know how to classify that animal. So they'll know whether it's a dog or a cat or a squirrel because they have some pre-existing information about what to look for. So that's the idea behind supervised learning. We want to, but instead of a child, of course, we're teaching a machine. So we want to try and identify the right data points that will effectively describe different scenarios so that, that the machine can recognize in the future. Um, and then we want to collect that data, teach the machine or the model how to make distinctions or how to identify distinct categories of things or uh, perhaps values, whole values, um, and then how to classify or predict those, um, those outcomes or those targets correctly. So some example applications in the real world Image classification is a very common application. So again, the example of recognizing animals or written characters, uh, this is a common application of supervised learning. Um, customer value prediction is another common application in business. So for example, could we predict which customers are going to spend a lot of money in our store or in our business and which customers won't spend a lot of money? And perhaps there's some indicative behaviors or indicative characteristics on, at a customer level that we could use to help make that prediction. Um, fraud detection, everybody probably has dealt with traveling at some point in your credit card being uh, blocked. So this is a really, really common application of supervised learning. Um, and uh, you know, if you've ever had your card blocked, um, typically what the bank is trying to figure out is, is the transaction being made fraudulent or not fraudulent? And it might use some characteristics like where the transaction is being made, how much, the type of category that uh, of uh, purchase that you're purchasing, for example, electronics or or something that's expensive or, or not, for example. So these are common applications of supervised learning, and 
there's about five or six different models that we will learn uh, during the course of the machine learning course. And of course, we are introduced to a few models um, in the foundations of data science course, course as well. Now, unsupervised learning is um, a little bit different than supervised in the sense that we use unsupervised learning when we don't know what the output should be. So let's say, for example, that you work at a company and you might wonder who is our best customer. So let's say that I work for um, Amazon and I'm trying to decide what makes somebody a great customer. And you might have people that, let's say, buy many, many different items, but maybe they're very cheap items. Maybe they don't result in a lot of revenue, but it's a really high volume, uh, high, high volume cart value. Um, and maybe this person buys every single day or every other day. So they're very frequent shoppers. Now, maybe on the, on the flip side, you might have somebody that doesn't shop at Amazon very often. However, they spend, every time they do shop, they spend a lot of money. So maybe they only shop once a month, but whenever they do shop, they spend $1,000 or $2,000. So which of these customers is better? In some, some cases, so as a human being, you may have some pre-existing idea about what makes uh, a customer a good customer. And so you might um, create some rules for yourself and you might just set some arbit arbitrary thresholds. You might say, well, you know, let's take all the customers that spend over $1,000 every three months and buy at least in four different categories. And those are going to be my high value customers. And then maybe you have some arbitrary definition for med medium value or low value customers. Now, unsupervised learning helps us remove that bias to an extent because instead of creating arbitrary definitions of what a high value, medium or low value customer is, we could actually use the data to find common patterns of customer behavior or, com or groups of customers that behave very similarly. And then we can try to find what are the common patterns that the model has identified or what are, what are the common behaviors that can help us segment those customers more effectively. By using data and not creating an arbitrary definition of what a high value, medium or low value customer is, um, this helps uh, remove some of the bias that we might place based on our own personal experience. And it helps us to identify patterns that we may not have actually thought about before or thresholds that we may not have thought about before. So that's an example of what unsupervised learning is. There's a number of different algorithms that exist that are called clustering algorithms, which we learn in the certificate. And these algorithms work with a series of uh, data points. So a number of different observations, many different features, and then they try to identify observations that are similar to each other. And after we've identified similar groups of observations or groups of customers, for example, um, we can then put a label on them so we can decide what those groups actually represent and how we might treat those customers in the real world. So some common uh, example applications of this of course, is customer segmentation, like the example that I just used. But another common application is anomaly detection. So for example, um, if you maybe don't know what fraud looks like in the company, uh, or maybe you're dealing with a new type of maybe failure. So if you work in a lot of um, maybe tech services or something like that, perhaps there's some failures that might happen in your systems. Um, this is a good way that you can identify common patterns of failures or common groups that you can then, um, then deal with, okay? So I will um, pause here. Hopefully that makes sense. And just checking quickly if there's any immediate questions. If you do have questions, feel free to post them in the chat and I will address them um, either as I'm speaking or um, the other folks will comment on your questions. Of course, we'll have a Q&A at the end as well. Now, the last uh, big area of machine learning that we'll quickly introduce today is reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is a really cool area of data science and, and machine learning in general. And these are models that learn as they go. So if you've ever had an experience where, um, you know, maybe as a child, your parents told you not to touch the hot stove and you touched it anyway, just to see what would happen. That's an example of reinforcement learning where um, you as a human being, for example, as you experience different situations, you are learning what happens. And then from that learning, you decide what you're gonna do next time you come across that situation. So suppose you touch the hot stove and you realize it's hot and it hurts. In the future, you're not going to touch the hot stove anymore because you know what happens after you do. Um, so that's the idea behind reinforcement learning models as well. Instead of us telling the models how to make decisions, we actually allow the models to learn by themselves. 
And when the models make good decisions that result in a positive outcome, then the models get rewarded with many points. But if they make a bad decision that has a negative outcome, the models get penalized with many points. And so um, a common application of this or a probably more well-known application of this is something like a self-driving car. Um, why would we use reinforcement learning? Well, we can't possibly train the self-driving car on every single situation that it's ever going to come across. And so that's why we can't use something like supervised learning because uh, everywhere that the car drives, there's so much variability that happens in day to day. Sometimes it's going to come across a red light. Maybe sometimes, you know, different types of people are crossing the road. Maybe sometimes there's no light and it has to make a decision to stop. So every situation that the car might come across is so variable that we need to teach it how to learn by itself and how to get better over time. Um, and so we might optimize the, we might set a set of constraints to the model for the self-driving car. So there's going to be a set of rules like don't hit any people uh, or animals, don't stop, uh, make sure you stop at a red light, um, you know, don't crash into other cars, don't crash into any objects. So there's going to be a set of constraints that the car is given. And then the car has to make decisions as it goes, um, which meet those constraints. So if it comes across a light, um, it'll decide whether to cross the street or not cross the street based on the objective of don't cross if it's a red light and don't hit anybody and don't hit anything. So that's an example of how that might work. Now, another great application of reinforcement learning is uh, live operations. And this refers to apps. Um, so a lot of apps and, for example, Facebook. Uh, Facebook will constantly send you notifications of different things, like if your friends are online or if somebody sends you a message or if there's a new article available, um, all the social media networks, Instagram, LinkedIn, these will all do, do this as well. Uh, this is a fairly uh, newer area of reinforcement learning, but it's an example of how we can apply this in, in more day-to-day -day, uh, interactions with, with customers as well or with users. Um, where we can optimize how and when notifications are sent to different customers or different users to try to keep them engaged uh, engaged in the app. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, that at least will give you some a little bit of overview of what the different types of machine learning models are that we would learn in this course. Now, when do we choose between supervised and unsupervised models? So this is a, a question that we get all the time on how do I know if I'm building um, if I'm building a supervised model or an unsupervised model? Um, generally, my guidance is that uh, with any sort of data science project that we're working on and any sort of machine learning model that we build, um, we always have to start with a really, really good understanding of the problem. Now, I know that deep learning, reinforcement learning, AI, these are hot topics and everybody wants to implement deep learning models everywhere, but deep learning models are not always the solution. Uh, sometimes we can pick much less complicated models which can solve the problem very effectively. So whenever we work with data, whenever we're building models, especially machine learning, data science, um, we always need to make sure that we have a really strong understanding of the problem and what we're actually solving for. Now, supervised learning is always useful when we already know the output that we would like, and we know how we know the data inputs that are relevant. So typically, this comes after we have done a ton of analysis and we've identified the independent variables which contribute to certain behavior in the dependent variable or the target. Um, so, for example, building a fraud detection model or predicting long-term customer value. Uh, these are these are solved problems. These are common problems in most organizations. Um, and most organizations will have data that will allow us to build these models with some level of accuracy. So these are examples when we would use uh, we would use supervised learning models. Now, unsupervised learning is useful when we don't know what the output is or want to make a fairly unbiased decision when trying to generate an output. Um, for example, whenever I start a new job at a new company, uh, especially if the company is small and they haven't done a lot of customer segmentation, one of my very first questions is, who is the customer? Who is the user? And what kind of users do we have? And this is a, a typical case for an unsupervised learning model, because if there isn't an existing segmentation that's rooted in data, then this is a perfect opportunity to run some sort of clustering algorithm and try to identify common behaviors across the user base and try to understand 
the types of users that that exist within uh, within the user base, and that's going to help you um, then select the right treatments, the right marketing tactics, the right engagement tactics, and so on. So that's an example of when we would choose uh, unsupervised learning. Okay. Um, so a couple of questions, uh, Juliana. I'm going to um, I'm going to quickly answer this question. Um, how do you? What information do you have for predicting customer value? to use supervised models? This is a good question. So um, sometimes you might have information like uh, similar customers who perhaps have similar demographics, maybe they're similar age, maybe they live in the same area, um, maybe they came from the same marketing channel, so perhaps they became a user through the same marketing channel. So this is all information that you can use early stages in the user behavior or customer behavior or customer demographics rather to predict the long term what their value might be. Um, as somebody spends more time with your company, then you will use purchasing behavior or uh, how they engage with you, engagement behavior with your company to try to predict long-term value. So typically customers who spend more money, perhaps they're more frequent buyers, um, perhaps they, uh, uh, you know, uh, perhaps they visit your website all the time or use your product all the time. These are typically good indicators that somebody would become a high value user over time. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Um, question on, do we need to know Python before we come into this program? You don't need to know Python beforehand, but you will be learning Python. So I'll do a quick demo now to show you the extent of some of the work that we'll do with Python. Um, question on the output. So when I say you know the output, are you referring to the predicted outcome, a response we already know? Um, Yasin, what I'm referring to is what I'm referring to is um, that I know what I'm trying to predict. And so when I'm building a predictive model, I will need to use situations that have already happened to teach the model what's happened in the past so that in the future, it can predict outcomes in the future, okay? Um, so one thing is cyber threats and risks. The threat landscape is big. This will add another um, challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, cyber, is, uh, cyber is the... Uh, cyber is a very big area. Um, cyber is, cyber security is a very tough area because there's a lot of types. Um, uh, there's a lot of different types of cyber crimes that can happen, and perhaps um, you know, perhaps you're looking for a type of model that can predict if what's happening is a cyber crime or not, or if it's a it's a threat or some sort of risk. And uh, this is kind of similar to fraud detection, right? So, I mean, with fraud, there's going to be behaviors that are very indicative of fraud. And I, I can just give a quick example of working for a mobile application now. Um, you know, farm bots, uh, bot farms, sorry, are a real thing. There are lots of people who try to take advantage of apps. And so there's lots of predictable behaviors like systemic clicking in an app, for example, or systemic refresh of an app or, um, you know, some sort of engagement that's done in a very predictable systemic way. So anytime we notice something like this, we know that this is fraud. Now, fraudsters, they do get more sophisticated over time. So we're never going to know all of the things that are happening that are fraud. And all the time, we do have to monitor user behavior and identify things that are, um, you know, don't look quite right or are working against the system that we've designed. Um, but it is something that we have to continually work on. So there's not going to be a situation where we know everything that's going to happen. As we build these data science models, as we learn new information about the techniques that fraudsters are using, we continually update and retrain our models to capture those new situations. So definitely challenging in a lot of areas. Um, cyber for sure is a very complicated field. Um, but yeah, that hopefully that, that is my comment, at least that I recognize that it's complicated. And, you know, it is something that we will need to um, we do need to work on, every company needs to work on uh, perpetually to, to continue to improve the models. Okay. All right. So um, hopefully this provides a general overview of the types of machine learning models. Now, I have not actually uh, explained any machine learning models here yet. These are just broad categories of types of machine learning models that exist. Um, supervised learning, there might be some models you've seen in the past, for example, linear regressions or logistic regressions. These are models that you might, if you've ever taken a statistics course, these are models that you might already be familiar with. Um, of course, with machine learning now, we have a lot more options than just probabilistic models. We also have models that are uh, geometric models that we can use, um, which again, uh, use a bit of math and, and help us classify, classify different, um, different scenarios. 
Um, now, the last quick thing I wanted to talk about before the mem the uh, demo here is what is what is uh, machine learning in data science, or how does how is it actually connected to data science? And so, um, my comment on this is that. Um, you know, data science is a very broad field. So I know uh, it's become quite popular over the last few years, as, as Larry mentioned earlier, with the growth of the internet, the amount of data, simply the amount of data that is being generated by tech companies and, and many companies these days. Um, and also the fact that we now have the computing capability at an accessible cost or a much lower cost than we did in the past. Um, companies are now able to actually invest in the field of data science and to work with the vast amounts of data that they have. Now, machine learning is a, a natural extension, uh, a natural extension of statistics, which is the core uh, field. And statistics and math are the core fields in, in data science that somebody would need to be familiar with. Um, it's not like a lot of the uh, I, there are there's constant research going on, but a lot of the kind of foundational data science and machine learning concepts have been around for many, many years. So technology and infrastructure has been the blocker up until now, but now we have that and we're able to deploy these models at scale. Now, statistics is a foundational uh, knowledge base that's required for data science. Um, statistics typically helps us understand what happened in the past. So it helps us answer questions like, what happened and why did it happen? Um, for example, if we have, let's say, a marketing campaign that worked really well in Vancouver, but not in Toronto, statistical analysis would help us identify why did the campaign work much better in Vancouver than in Toronto? And what are the elements of the campaign perhaps that resonated with the customer base in Vancouver? Now, machine learning, the reason I say that it's a natural extension is because machine learning models allow us to um, use some data from what's happened in the past so that the model can learn. And then using that knowledge, the model can make predictions in the future. Um, as uh, many companies uh, now, not only do we want to understand why things happen, but we want to be able to make predictions about the future because this way we can make better decisions earlier on. So we don't have to wait for um, you know, something to, to work or to not work before we learn from it. We can actually learn uh, from stuff, stuff that's happened in the past and make some reasonable assumptions about what might happen in the future, which can then uh, help us make better decisions as a business. Um, but again, the biggest benefit of machine learning and why it's an important part of data science is because we're really trying to automate decision-making. So the main idea behind machine learning you're trying to learn about how people make decisions, um, how to collect data that allows us to understand people's decision-making processes, and then how to um, scale that understanding so that we can build personalized experiences if we're dealing with, with customers or if we're dealing with business, um, or even uh, in the medical field, in the research fields, machine learning is very common on uh, making decisions without the element of human bias and error, or at least eliminating the uh, elements of human bias and error as much as possible. Okay. All right. Uh, so I do see some questions around the course and um, I will let the team answer those in the chat. Um, now, I just want to quickly flag that I am doing a quick introduction here of machine learning. However, the course is four different courses. The machine learning course is actually the third course in the certificate program. So you would have to take the foundations of data science and statistics for data science before you move into machine learning. I would uh, highly advise not to jump right into machine learning if you don't have a background in statistics, math, and or Python. Um, the foundations course and the stats course will give you the foundation, foundational knowledge that you should have before you jump into machine learning so that um, you can understand and you can follow along and you can actually, the content can resonate with you, okay? Um, and in terms of the course outline, um, I will let the Wattspeed team provide a link to that. Uh, and then there is some questions around a dedicated time per week. Um, so 15 to 20 hours for the course uh, per week, that is about the recommended time. So if you're very new to the field, I would recommend spending 15 to 20 hours. Um, and we typically have about an hour and a half of lecture uh, of live sessions every single week. Okay. Okay, so let's move on to the demo. And then to your question, we are actually using Python for machine learning. So um, I'm going to do a quick demo of what building a machine learning model looks like in Python. Um, and hopefully this will give you a good sense of the type of uh, type of complexity that you can expect. Now, again, um, uh, if you are new to Python, 
don't worry, uh, we do cover an introduction to Python in the certificate. So the main, uh, our intent or our assumption is that you're coming in and you don't have any Python knowledge at all. Um, so we're assuming that you, this is your first time using Python. So if a lot of this looks uh, kind of unfamiliar to you right now, if you've never programmed in any language before, um, I understand that it might look a little bit abstract, but don't worry, we do walk you every walk you through everything step by step when you do take the certificate program. Um, so by the time you're done with the certificate, you should be fairly comfortable writing code the way that I am now. Um, and so we will, uh, hopefully this will give you uh, at least a sense of what, what you're able to do. Um, good question on auto ML. Um, just a quick comment here. What about the auto ML applications available these days? Um, there are certainly lots of auto ML applications available, and these are always coming out. And honestly, even with uh, sources like ChatGPT and, and some of these tools that are now available, um, the world of coding has become a lot more accessible. And um, certainly these models have become a lot more accessible. Um, that said, in my experience, auto ML uh, isn't quite a solution that we can readily deploy on a lot of complex um, complex use cases. So it certainly is very helpful in dealing with simple use cases. So we don't have to actually spend a lot of time building and testing and validating for use cases that are very simple to build these days. So that's really great. Um, however, it does give us the time to spend on more complicated use cases. So I actually quite welcome tools that make the data science model development process faster. Again, like ChatGPT, AutoML. These are great tools to um, take care of all the small use cases very quickly so that you can spend your time solving more complex problems. Um, but of course, for the more complex problems, you do still have to um, know what the models do, how to work with them, how to interpret them and so on. So um, very much the foundational knowledge is still required. Okay. All right, so um, let's get started here. So the first thing that we typically do, so what I'm showing now, this is called a Google Colab notebook. And this is an online version of a Jupyter notebook, which is one of the tools that we use in the course. Um, now a notebook is an environment where we write Python code. So Python is a programming language. For those of you who've never programmed before, there are many programming languages out there. So Python, JavaScript, C++, uh, these are all different languages that exist that allow us to write code. Um, you may even, if you've ever built macros in Excel, you might have used VBA in the past. That's another example of a programming language. Now, whenever we are writing code, we need a place to write it. So we can't just randomly start typing on our computer. We need some sort of editor to write the code in. And so in our case, um, we're going to be using, uh, in this case, I'm using Google Colab. We also use Jupyter Notebook. There's also VS Code, which supports Jupyter Notebook. There's PyCharm. There's tons of different editors out there. Um, and every data scientist will pick the one that they like best. But this is an example of one that uh, we typically use in the course. Now, the second, the first thing that we do when we set up the notebook, so we've got the notebook up and running, um, we have to import something called li a library. So there's a number of different libraries that we use. Now, libraries are effectively frameworks or, or um, uh, collections of functions that allow us to perform specific operations. So if you think about, if you've ever done a statistics course and you've ever built a linear regression, um, maybe you know how to do a linear regression from scratch. So you know that there's some formulas, you can calculate you know, some values and you can calculate with sort of the line of best fit and things like that. Um, and, and you can do all of the math by yourself to build this type of model. What a library does is it takes the math and stores it into a simple function for you so that you don't have to do all of that from scratch. Um, and similarly to how in Excel, you might use a function that does a specific set of operations so that you don't have to do them by hand. Very similarly, a library in a programming language will hold a set of functions that, uh, a set of functions that perform specific actions so that you don't have to do them by hand. Now, pandas is a library which we use for uh, pandas is a library which we use for uh, data manipulation. So this is a library that allows us to bring in data from external data sources, organize that data, filter, slice and dice. So any of the typical things that you might do in Excel, we can typically do with with pandas. Now the second library that I'm going to import here is Seaborn. And this is an example of a visualization library. So this is how we can create visuals in Python. Um, in a Jupyter notebook, this is how we can create the different charts that can help us understand data. And now I'm going to import a few different things from SKLearn. So scikit-learn is a library for machine learning. 
So first, I'm importing a train test split function, which allows us to take a data set and split it into some data to train the model and some data to test how well the model makes predictions. Then I'm going to import a model called at Then I'm going to import um, a evaluation metric. So this is called accuracy score. So this is a way that we can measure the effectiveness of the model. And then I'm going to import a data set. Now, um, I'm loading this data set called wine. So this is a data set about different types of wines. So for anybody here who likes to drink wine, um, let me see, okay, neighbor. Sorry, I'm missing an S here. Uh, for anybody who drives, uh, likes to drink wine, uh, there's a publicly available data set with all kinds of information about wine. So different uh, categories of wine. And um, these categories are based on uh, different elements of the wine. So for example, uh, the flavors of it, the magnesium levels, the acidity of the wine, the alcohol content. So lots of different elements about wine can help us predict the type of wine that we are dealing with. Now I'm gonna use a few functions and I will share this notebook after if you're curious to look at it. Uh, this, is a, this is a quick function here um, to actually load the data from scikit-learn. So normally when we pull in the data, it's going to look a little bit messy like this. So we do have to actually transform it. Um, now what the data tells us here is that uh, this, so this is first of all, the data points that we have. So we have alcohol content, we have alkalinity of the wine, um, and so on. Uh, these are all the different data points. This is, right now is stored, uh, first of all, in a dictionary and then in a NumPy array. So this, these are some of the data objects that we deal with. And then we have three categories of wine. We have category zero, category one, and category two. Um, and then uh, we can see some more information about the different column names. So typically data might come in, in some, sort of, um, uh, some sort of structure like this. Now we do need to pre-process the data to make it readable because this is currently this is very difficult to work with and we can't really read it and so a machine learning model will not really be able to read it. So I'm going to take the data and I'm going to convert it into something called a data frame. And a data frame is a pandas object. Now I've imported my pandas library here. So I'm going to use pandas to create a data frame that consists of all of the data plus all of the known outcomes. So I'm going to isolate from my data object. I'm going to isolate, first of all, the data, uh, the, da the actual data field, which is going to be this dictionary here. OK, and then I'm going to uh, data. There we go. Uh, and then I'm going to set the feature names which are the titles of the columns. So this is this element right here. These are the titles of the columns. I'm going to add them as the column names here. And let me, uh, I need to actually close this over here. There we go. And then I need to add in the second one. So pd.data frame, and I'm gonna call this the target, uh, target values and the columns. This one is gonna go, be called target. Okay. And then I'm going to join these together. So now I have a much more readable data frame here. So my data frame is gonna look something like this. So if I uh, just display some information about the data frame, um, this data frame has 178 rows of data. These are the different columns that I have. So alcohol content, malic acid, ash, alkalinity, magnesium, and so on. So hue, proline, and so on. And then at the end, I've got my output variable. So I have three potential classes of wine, class zero, class one, and class two. Now from here, I can uh, use a few lines of code to build a, a predictive model fairly easily. So the first thing that I typically need to do is I need to identify my input variables and my output variable. So my input variables are going to be all of these data points that I have about the wine 
and my output variable or my target is going to be this last column here, the target column. So I'm going to write this as sort of X and Y. So X typically represents the input variables. So I'm going to take all of the columns and everything up until row or uh, column 13. And then my Y variable is going to be all of the rows um, and only column 13. So this is going to be my X and Y. So now you'll see that I have separated my output variable, so all my classes, from the input variables. And this is a really important step in machine learning because um, we, need to, uh, we need to separate the inputs and the outputs. Now I can very simply build a training data set, testing data set using my inputs and outputs. And I can use the train test split function. And I can set a test size here. Oh, sorry, at 0 0.2. Okay. And now I can build my model. So I'm currently building a k nearest neighbor model. And you'll see how easy it is to do this actually in Python. I'm going to select five neighbors, like so. Um, I've now initialized my model here. I've set up some parameters. Now I'm going to train the model using the training data, X train and Y train. And uh, that's it. And the model has been trained. And now I'm going to make some predictions. So I'm going to make some predictions here using the testing data. And now my model has used some of the data, the input data available, and it has made some predictions about the categories based on those input variables. And now I need to compare how accurate are those predictions? So we can see that the first observation, the model predicted that the uh, category of the wine should be category zero. And um, that was correct. I can see in my actual data set that it was actually zero. In my second one, the model predicted that the category should be one. And I can see that the, it, this is actually correct as well. So the prediction was correct. The third prediction, however, was not correct. So I can see that the model predicted that based on the data, the um, output should be two, but actually the output should have been category one. So the model did not make a correct prediction here. Now, what we will typically use is an accuracy score. So we can print the accuracy score of the model and by comparing the predicted values to the actual values. So we can see that our model is 73% accurate. Now, this may seem a little bit abstract, but to make this real, so what am I trying to do with this model? So I'm trying to um, understand how do these different characteristics about wine actually relate to the category of the wine? So we can even do some exploratory analysis, for example, to look at that. So for example, uh, I can compare the um, alcohol content uh, with, uh, sorry. Uh, DF uh, target. We're going to call this the hue, actually. Uh, let's compare, for example, the alcohol content and something else. Let's pick another variable. Let's look at malic acid. And we can try to see if there's differences between the categories. I have an extra parenthesis here. There we go. Um, so for example, we can see that alcohol content and malic acid differ between the three different categories. So if I simply plot a scatter plot of each of the categories of wine, you can see that category zero typically has higher alcohol content and lower malic acid content. Category one typically has lower alcohol content. So a lot of the orange dots are kind of to the left of the alcohol content. And category two has high, um, medium alcohol content, but it has higher malic acid content. So already I can see that the three categories are pretty well differentiated just by their alcohol content and malic acid content. Um, and so what my model is trying to do or what the machine learning model is trying to do is it's trying to find, identify these patterns automatically and try to predict um, if a certain alcohol or if a certain bottle of wine has a certain amount of alcohol or certain amount of malic acid, is it going to be a zero or one or a two? And we can see based on our model accuracy here that we can, with 72% accuracy, so it's not 100%, so it's not perfect, 
But with some accuracy, we can use the data that we've been given to predict the category of the wine. Now in here, what you might notice is that some of the categories do overlap. And this is always the challenge with machine learning because in the real world, um, wine categories are not actually uh, cleanly separable. So you are going to see some overlap between categories. And that's why the score is never going to be 100%, because sometimes there are going to be wines that are category two, but they actually have some characteristics of category one and zero. So um, the model is never going to be perfect, but our job as data scientists to make the model better and to improve it over time, our job is to try to either find new data, reframe the data in a different way, or perhaps tune the parameters of the model to try to increase the accuracy. So Anson, to the pro to your point, um, uh, there are many different techniques that we can use to improve model accuracy. A lot of the time, it's going to be either um, working with the existing data that we have, or trying to get our hands on even more data, or trying to tune the model. So that's called hyperparameter tuning. Okay, uh, the seventy two percent simply compares the number of correct predictions. So here, the model predicted zero, and the actual prediction, the actual value was zero. So this one was correct. Um, then it predicted one, this one was also correct, this one was incorrect. So the model predicted two here, but the actual value was one. So this was not a correct prediction. So simply the accuracy score counts the number of correct predictions out of the total predictions that it made. Okay. Um, so let me wrap up here because I do want to make sure that we have a bit more time to provide context for the program and to answer any additional questions that you might have. But hopefully this gives you um, a quick overview of what you would learn in the course and how you, you would learn to uh, work with Python to build machine learning models. And now I will um, hand it back over to Larry to provide additional context on the program and answer additional questions. So let me share the presentation again here. Thanks, Delina. Um, so um, I'm going to do a quick introduction to our uh, certificate program now. Um, so what are some of the skills that you need to, to work in data science? A lot of the people who take our program are people who uh, are either looking to apply data science in their day-to-day -day jobs where they work today or are looking for a change of career. We have some people who, uh, for example, one of our instructors uh, was a uh, um, a chemist, a researcher at the University of Toronto who wanted to try something a little bit different, took the program and uh, and is now working uh, in the industry. Um, we have lots of cases of, uh, of people who've made the career transition. To work in data science, you really need a lot of different things. It's um, You need to understand, of course, about machine learning, but also about uh, statistics. Um, there are lots of questions, you know, what's the relationship to statistics, um, how much statistics are required. Um, well, um, the machine learning models themselves are, by their nature, statistical models. Um, that doesn't mean that you need to know a lot of statistics to be able to operate the models, but you need to know enough statistics to be able to interpret the quality of the answers that you're getting from the models. Um, the, the models will typically provide you with a prediction of some kind, but also a lot of background information about how much confidence it has in the prediction that it's made based on the data that it's seen in the past, whether it has a big enough database of experience on which the model was trained to be able to give you uh, uh, a prediction with um, some particular level of uh, level of precision. So it so it's probably that it's, it's probably also interpreting the outputs of the models and uh, and putting them in context. So there is some knowledge of statistics required. Um, some knowledge of business. Um, our courses, although they are very meaty, um, they're um, we, we go right into you know how you actually uh, build up and train these models yourself, and and there is programming involved in it. But we cast everything in the context of business solutions and business applications, so that you can see how you apply these things in the real world. 
Um, so working data scientists need to know something about the business that they interact with in order to be able to make that connection between the theory and the practice of data science and the application to sp actual business uh, issues. You need to know a little bit of software engineering. Uh, one of our courses focuses on data engineering, which is how do you build systems that are able to intake, process, uh, and store vast quantities of data on the scale of the internet and, and at the velocities of data movement of things like uh, like Twitter or X, <laughs> for example. Uh, you need to know a little bit of programming, you need to know visualization, how to take that data and turn it into something that's easy to consume for people. We talk about techniques for building visualizations that uh, um, make it easier for people to, to actually consume the message, understand the message that the data is trying to tell us, um, and how in general to do storytelling, how to wrap it up into something that people can, um, can understand and relate to and see how to apply in the real world expertise in uh, your subject area, um, all of these things. Um, so we try to give you a, a balanced diet of uh, as many of these things as, as we can. Um, and then you bring your own knowledge and experience as well. Um, typically a, a data scientist, although they're a generalist and know a little bit in all these areas, typically any given data scientist chooses two or three areas where they, they go deep and um, um, so that they can apply that knowledge in the more general context. Um, next slide, please. Um, so our program, which has been around for, well, I, I don't know, maybe eight years or, or so uh, since it was uh, first developed, um, it's four courses, Foundations of Data Science. Um, so foundations is a general introduction to data science. And if it's something that you don't know for sure, whether it's something that you might be interested in, you can take that one course. It'll give you an overview, a grounding, and then based on that, you can decide whether or not you, you want to go on and do the other courses. Statistics for data science. Um, so this covers all of the stats that you need for this and uh, other uh, later uh, artificial intelligence uh, courses as well, offered by uh, Wattspeed and also uh, by Toronto SCS. Um, there's a question about how much depth is required. Um, well, the we do use, uh, or we, we do recommend textbooks for all of these courses. They're not required texts, but we strongly recommend them. The text for this is uh, Open Intro Statistics, which is a freely available, and, and in fact, um, uh, almost all of the textbook materials for this course are freely available on, on the internet. Um, not 100%, but, but most of it. Um, and, uh, and if you are comfortable with the contents of a book like that, then you, then you have a statistical background. Although we do cover more than just that, um, this course is a little bit unusual in the sense that we also cover the the newer causal analysis, which is um, it, it's a, a new development in the last few years that in some ways invalidates a, a lot of the statistical modeling that, that was done uh, in the 20th century, actually, because it, uh, uh, it demonstrates the need for understanding the causal relationships between the factors influencing the model in order to be able to interpret the model correctly. We, we, we spend... Uh, three weeks on that. Um, the machine learning course, of course. And then uh, the last one is one that I mentioned about uh, data engineering, getting into the, the guts of how you uh, how you manage very large quantities of data. Um, next slide, please. Some of our instructors, um, I'm often asked what's the difference between this program and say a master's of analytics program offered uh, um, by universities. Um, other than the price, and there's a huge difference in the cost, and this program is much less expensive than doing a master's. Um, the other part of it is our instructors, and the program is intended as continuing education. It's for people who already um, typically have an undergraduate or, or higher degree, but not necessarily. We have people who uh, in the program uh, who have not done a degree before, but um, is intended for people who are 
interested in rolling up their sleeves, working with the models, less interested in the theory, although we do cover the theory, but we don't, uh, for example, examine in the theory in the same way that a, a master's degree program would, uh, where you would, uh, by way of examination, be uh, re be required to demonstrate facility with the mathematics itself. We don't do that. Our program is uh, is a combination of assignments and a term project at the end. You get to meet other people in the program and uh, and work on practical uh, projects of your choice. Um, so where I was going with this is our instructors are are all um, working professionals. Um, some of them teach um, at other universities as well, um, but um, essentially all of them are uh, are people who uh, are working data scientists on a day-to-day -day basis and bring that practical experience that you don't necessarily get with a purely academic program. Next slide, please. Um, so some of the things that you'll learn. Um, so, uh, there were questions about uh, needing to know Python. Um, it's not required that you know Python to begin. Um, if you know a programming language, we teach Python as we go. If you've done no programming at all before, uh, what we would recommend is uh, there are short courses around in Python, like generic courses in, in programming, to get you a little bit of programming experience uh, to begin with. Um, Wattspeed provides one, um, uh, and as well, there's good resources online. Um, there's a good free textbook, uh, Think Python, um, if you read that book um, and, uh, and followed it, um, you would have all of the programming background that you would need uh, for this, this course. We teach Pandas, um, which is a, a general purpose library for working with data sets on your laptop. You get to install these things and work with them all yourself uh, on your laptop. Uh, we teach about visual visualization. We teach about SQL uh, first in the first course and then advanced SQL in the fourth course. Probability, I mentioned inference. So this is how you use statistics to come to conclusions um, using statistical testing, uh, regression and classification. So this, these are predictive models. Uh, neural nets, next slide, please. Feature selection and dimensionality reduction are advanced machine learning techniques. Um, we talk about uh, uh, Spark and a variety of other uh, uh, big data related technology. So our start, um, yeah, we can just go ahead to the, to the next slide. Um, so the program structure, um, officially eight to 12 hours of, of, uh, of work each week. Uh, outside of the uh, live sessions. Um, as Delina mentioned, you might want to uh, um, you you might want to set aside more time than that because uh, if you haven't worked with any of this before, um, it is a very, you know, very robust program. Um, we have readings from the recommended textbooks. We provide Jupyter notebooks, which are a kind of interactive notebook where you uh, we provide code examples, and you can run them live in, in the notebook. Uh, we run regular uh, weekly webinars. So each week in each of the courses, there's a, um, an hour and a half with the instructor to answer questions, to highlight some of the, the more complex issues. Um, you interact with the instructor and with uh, other participants, primarily through a discussion board. Um, each is, each uh, course is three to four assignments. And as I mentioned, we have uh, term projects at the end. Um, yeah, we're coming up on, on one o'clock. Um, I'm fine with staying on a little bit longer to uh, answer questions if uh, if people would like. Um, I think that's the last slide of the formal presentation. Okay, thank you, Larry, and, and thanks for stating that you're comfortable staying for a little bit longer. Uh, so yeah, everyone, we are now entering the formal question and answer segment of our workshop. Um, so 
we've been getting a lot of questions in the chat, which is great. If people would like to continue to deliver their questions that way, that is totally fine. Uh, if you do have a question that you want to ask verbally, feel free to just unmute your microphone and uh, deliver the question and, and we'd be happy to answer it. Uh, Hi, I will thanks. start. Oh, go ahead. Hi, Ethan. Good. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Ethan and Larry. Very helpful. I had a question. What's the last date by which we need to register for this course? Can I do this by the 10th of September? By the 10th of September would be acceptable. Yes, our, our next start date is September 25th. So Correct. the 10th of September is uh, about the maximum amount of time beforehand that we would recommend. We do want to have people registering about two weeks before, but any time between now and September 10th, if you're trying to you know, get financials in order or just plan your schedule for your work situation, then that would be completely fine. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Yeah, now, no now, having said that, registration does stay open until the course starts. So although it's it's better if you register early, uh, if if you miss the 10th, uh, chances are still good that you would probably get in. That's correct. It will stay open. Uh, we just recommend that people register as quick as they, or not as quick, as early as they can for the sake of setting up your account that you will need to access our learning platform. But if you are unable to coordinate that by the 10th, it will still be open beyond that date. Thanks, Ethan. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, you're welcome. There, there were lots of questions about um, prerequisites. And, and, and I should say that these courses are what we call open enrollment. Um, if you have the prerequisites to do just the machine learning course, you could take just the machine learning course. Having said that, the courses are designed so that each of them builds on the other. And, and so you would only want to do that if you were absolutely sure that you, you had um, equivalent content to the earlier courses under your belt uh, before you did that. Um, we recommend taking the courses one at a time. We strongly discourage taking multiple courses simultaneously because the workload, as I mentioned, is significant. Um, and if you do feel that you have prerequisites um, that would allow you to skip one of the courses, there is a mechanism to uh, to get uh, get credit essentially for one of the four courses towards uh, the certificate. Um, there's a process for that where um, you have to submit your credentials and there's a $150 fee associated with it. Um, um, and there's, uh, um, Watspeed can provide you with more details on, on that if, uh, if that's uh, appropriate to your situation. Yeah, absolutely. If that's something that somebody would be wanting to look into as an option, uh, feel free to just connect with us via email and we can provide you the steps that you would need to take to uh, look into that prior learning assessment that Larry's just mentioned. Uh, we had a question. Uh, I see that Delina actually just answered it in the chat, but for those of you that might have missed it, it was asking about the webinars, um, asking if they are live or if they are pre-recorded. So they are live during a set time during the week, but if you are unable to attend, then they are recorded so that you can watch at a later date. Um, attendance is not mandatory. It is recommended because you would get a better experience out of being there live and having the availability to ask questions. But if you register for your course and come to find that the time that these live sessions are being held doesn't work for you, then you are still able to watch the recordings after they take place. Uh, another question, just asking what time the live sessions usually do happen. Uh, Larry, do you want to give just a general idea about where we typically see these fall in? Um, most of them have tended to be Sunday morning um, because uh, the, the, uh, the students uh, tended to, to uh, find that convenient, but, um, uh, but not always. Uh, some of them are in the evening. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I see another question that is asking about the cost for all four courses. Uh, so for the data science certificate, each course is $995 plus applicable taxes. That would be dependent on where you reside when we're talking about the tax aspect. Um, I will say, we do have registration open for three start dates at the moment. So we have this upcoming September 25th start date, and then we have a date in January of 2024 and April of 2024. We have these dates open so that you have the availability to register ahead and plan accordingly if you would like to. 
But from a financial perspective, if it is too cumbersome to take on, you know, three course registrations or four course registrations all at once, then you can absolutely register for one at a time as you pro progress through the certificate. And uh, that would be the cost of each course and, you know, on a cumulative basis time, times four. And I also mentioned that uh, the this program overlaps a little bit with the University of Toronto School Continuing Studies Artificial Intelligence Certificate. So the machine learning course from this program is one of the courses towards the uh, AI certificate. So many people uh, do the data science, then uh, move on to uh, to do the AI certificate uh, as well. Thanks, Larry. Uh, we have a question that upon completion of the four courses, is there a path to gain a master's degree program in data science? So I will touch on one aspect and then turn it over to Larry. Um, these four courses are professional development courses, so they do not count towards a undergraduate degree or a master's degree or uh, anything that has a credit-based nature to it. However, if you do complete these courses and you are interested in pursuing a master's degree, uh, Larry, do you have any recommendations for that situation? Well, we, we have uh, quite a few people that do that. Um, every term, pretty much, there's, there's one or more uh, people who have completed uh, either this certificate or the related certificates. And uh, have decided to to go back and and do a, a full master's uh, in a in a related area, and um, although as Ethan mentioned, it doesn't count towards um, uh, directly towards credits for doing a master's. It does uh, set you up uh, with the preliminary information that you need to be able to to do a master's. Like it'll make the master's a lot easier, and it probably. I can't say for sure, but it probably makes it easier to get into the program if you already have these under your belt. Um, and, and assuming that you've performed well, um, I, I um, often do, a, and other instructors will do a, a letter of recommendation to, uh, to assist that process. Yeah, great points, Larry. Thank you for adding that. Um, our next question is asking about scholarships or financial aid options. Uh, unfortunately, these questions, these courses are not eligible for for OSAP. Uh, there are no financial aid options at the moment outside of our recommendation is that you do uh, connect with your employer if that's applicable to you. If there's any program that you have at your uh, place of employment that would be willing to either cover the costs due to you know career progression or if it's just part of your benefit package, uh, that would be the typical route that we would say that you would explore. Um, another question related to the master's one, will this help with the admission to a undergrad degree? Uh, Larry, would the answer that you just stated beforehand be similarly applicable? Yeah, yeah, it'd be the same answer. All you know, right, thank you. They're going to look at the full range of your prior academics and any transcripts for any degree program that, that you go into. And, and this would be one factor that, uh, especially with a mature student, um, like, with mature students, they're going to be much more interested in what you've done recently, um, and, and so it, it would be valuable in that sense, I would expect. Thanks, Larry. Uh, I think at the moment we've covered the questions that are in the chat, so I will give it another minute here. I know we've ran a little bit late. I want to thank everybody for your patience for staying on and your interest for staying on, obviously, for uh, having this Q&A and for your attention that we've had for the last hour and 10 minutes. We really do appreciate it. Uh, we have now received one more question. Uh, is there an option to have a test skip the statistics for data science class for someone who has a statistics background? Yeah, so Larry had mentioned a little bit earlier that there is a prior learning assessment. Um, that is an option that you can pursue if you feel like you have the credentials that would deem you uh, able to, you know, receive uh, advanced standing in one of the courses. You can only receive it one time. So if statistics is something that you feel is applicable for your situation and you would like to pursue that, uh, we would just ask that you send us an email at watspeed at uwaterloo.ca to discuss the steps in that. Or if you want to look into it, um, the University of Toronto School of Continuing Studies is the one that 
overlooks the application for that prior learning assessment. So if you do want to just jump a step and go directly to them, that would be another recommendation as well, but that does exist. There is a fee, uh, Larry, you said it was about $150 to apply. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I'm gonna drop my uh, LinkedIn coordinates into the chat here. Anybody who would like to send me a LinkedIn invitation, I'll be, be happy to link in with you. Awesome. Uh, okay, I think the questions have kind of slowed down. And we, as I mentioned, we are a bit past time. So let's call it there. Um, if anyone has any questions that come up later that they want to connect about, you can absolutely send us an email or give us a call here at Wattspeed, and we would be happy to help you out. But for now, uh, thank you, Larry. Thank you, Delina. And thank you, everybody, for attending. As a reminder, our next start date is September 25th, and registration is currently live on our website right now. Uh, if you enjoyed this workshop and you have a friend or a colleague in mind that you'd like to share it with, please feel free to do that once our recording is distributed, and we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, so once again, thanks, everybody. We look forward to seeing you on September 25th, and we hope, we, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.